Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, our work with invasive species in the Malibu Creek watershed um, through my organization, the Mountains Restoration Trust. Um, I'm a biologist and the program manager for um, our aquatics work. Okay, the next one. Um, really quickly, before we get into the talk, I'm going to talk about my organization. So the Mountains Restoration Trust has been working in the Santa Monica Mountains um, since 81. Um, we've been doing a lot of restoration work. Um, by and large, we're um, a land trust, so we do acquisition. So we buy up property, um, natural space, and um, once we have that, we restore it and make it accessible for research and for the public to use it um, for recreation and multiple uses such as that. And um, through um, our sort of three pillars, we're able to accomplish this. So like education, we have um, a phenomenal program that partners with the UC reserve system um, called the Cold Creek Docents. Um, and then we also do a lot of like community-based volunteer events that help us accomplish our goals. Um, and then those are our links, you can go on. <laughs> And then really quickly to go into my background, um, we already touched on it a little bit, but um, I'm a UCLA graduate um, and I've worked on a variety of systems. This is my first time in um, freshwater streams, but I've worked um, in the neotropics on bugs um, and invertebrates that live in um, plants. I've worked with um, uh, brown bats um, in the Central Valley. Um, and uh, more recently, I worked on intertidal communities assessing how invasive species um, uh, interacted there. Um, and now I'm in freshwater systems. We'll talk about that. Um, so quickly before we move on, um, I'm gonna just do some like terms. Um, so invasive species are basically the focus of my talk. So these are um, non-native species that are harmful to the ecosystems in which they're introduced into. And a lot of invasive species share a lot of similar characteristics. So um, they can be very aggressive at resources, whether that's um, food or habitat or whatever it might be. Um, they're very often um, very um, environmentally plastic or they're able to adapt. Um, so they um, aren't very, um, they're very good at um, invading areas because of these things. They're not very sensitive to changes in temperature or um, water quality or things like that. Um, and then also um, they're really good at reproducing, doing it fast and um, doing a lot of it. Um, and so these are just some um, common um, invasive species that we deal with in um, our sort of region. So we have um, New Zealand mud snails, um, Arundo, um, and um, bullfrogs. Yep, so in um, our project areas, we're dealing largely with um, just a handful of aquatic invasive species, and these are the ones that um, largely we're working on removal projects to get rid of. Um, and so we have um, several fish species that have been introduced one way or another. Um, Gambusia is a mosquito fish that I'm, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with through vector control methods. Um, Largemouth bass is a sort of sport fish that a lot of anglers um, like to um, uh, you know, catch and eat. And um, so bluegill and green sunfish um, as well. Um, I'm gonna be talking specifically about our work with um, Progamberus clarkii, um, the red swamp crayfish. Um, and so crayfish were an introduced species from um, Louisiana in the south. Um, they were thought to be introduced here um, from um, fishermen that use them as bait fish, so a lot of big fish like carp and um, catfish and um, uh, bass like to eat them. Um, so um, oftentimes we'll actually have requests from our volunteers after the events. They'll ask us after we've spent hours um, removing these crayfish from the streams, they ask us, oh, so we're fishermen, can we um, take these fish and go use them in our streams? <laughs> and that's exactly how these sort of invasions start. Um, and um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, sort of why we're removing them, so we can go on. So first and foremost, um, crayfish do a lot of damage to the streams in a variety of ways. So macrophytes, um, it's just uh, aquatic plants basically with root systems and they're super important to the health of the stream. Um, macrophytes do, um, well, first of all, crayfish do a lot of um, consumptive and non-consumptive clipping of it, basically. So they, they eat the macrophytes, the aquatic plants, and then they also clip them. It's part of their behavior to clip them and not consume them. And um, they've been shown to have large impacts on these macrophytes, these aquatic plants in the streams. 
And um, this can have a lot of sort of um, negative impacts on the streams because the macrophytes are very important. They do a lot of work to hold in sediment, which can be important for erosion control. They do a lot of um, um, filtering and um, uh, making sure that the flow in the stream is at the level that's appropriate for those areas. And when um, crayfish come in, um, you notice um, dramatic decreases in the amount of macrophytes and then also um, the different species. So basically the crayfish can decimate entire populations and leave streams barren, which can be very um, impactful. And then also, as you can see, this little cutie here, um, they uh, like to burrow um, in the streams and also um, they don't use the water column, the, excuse me, the water column. So they do a lot of walking on the bottom of the stream and through the burrowing um, behavior and also through um, just how they walk on the bottom of the streams, they stir up a lot of the sediment. And so when you have um, creeks that have a lot of um, water coming through them, when you're flushing up a bunch of sediment, it transports it downstream. And the sediment can, again, just similar to the macrophytes, be um, very impactful to the stream. So it can have a lot of things to do with the water quality. If a stream has a lot of dissolved solids in it, the water quality can um, be affected, um, as well as sort of the erosional quality of the stream banks. So if you have a bunch of crayfish burrowing on the sides of the stream banks, they erode, they're not very stable. Um, and this has been studied in a lot of applications, but specifically people have looked at um, salmonids that um, lay their eggs in gravel and in sand particles, and this can be very impactful, which um, has a lot to do with sort of the grant funds that we're working off of. So um, uh, MRT, my project that I'm in charge of is working off of a fisheries habitat restoration grant. Um, and our goal is to impact upstream habitat for the salmonids that um, are in our streams or for the Southern California steelhead trout. And by um, cleaning up the streams, once they have access to these watersheds, they're able to you know, lay their eggs and survive. But if we have, um, invasives like crayfish, this um, can make it more difficult for them. And then sort of um, more iconically, this is a picture, it um, it's, might be hard to see, but... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tadpole from a um, Pacific tree frog. Um, if it's hard, kind of hard to see, but um, sort of uh, very literally, the crayfish um, are sort of voracious predators. So they like to, um, they basically decimate any populations that they're near. Um, and they don't show very high preference for anything. They just sort of eat or um, kill everything. They're <laughs> Uh, not very nice. So um, in some of our study sites, we've been looking at populations of natives and how they relate to the amounts of crayfish that we find in our streams. Um, so in these graphs, you can see um, in the red, these are um, our total catches of crayfish um, on a monthly basis. And then um, in these slides, I'm just looking at the tadpoles of the Pacific tree frog. And you can see at this study site, um, it's from 2015 to 2017. And you can see um, sort of uh, some sort of relationship. We don't have um, many seasons in this, so it's hard to tell. But you can see some sort of basic relationship between um, the amount of crayfish in the stream seasonally when the tadpole or when the frogs are breeding, and the amount of crayfish. And you can go to the next one. This one's a more sort of I think clear distinction. Um, so you can see as um, the crayfish removal um, occurs from 2014 to 2017, and as um, as the red bar is going down, you're seeing in the first um, spring when the frogs are breeding, we're seeing um, a very low population of these tadpoles of these breeding populations of frogs. In the second year of the project, after removal for um, two years, we're seeing basically a twofold increase in the amount of tadpoles that we're seeing in the creek, and then in the third year, almost a threefold increase. So it's like a very direct relationship between how many crayfish are in the stream and sort of the native populations that are very important. You can go to the next one. And then again, it's very similar in a different creek that we have a study site in. You see that similar, similar pattern as um, removal continues. We're seeing more and more natives return to the habitat. We're seeing something of a sort of we call a functional lift. So we're seeing return of function to the stream after um, getting rid of this invasive species. Um, and then this is just sort of going into the same exact point. So this is another creek in the Malibu Creek watershed, and this is um, a California newt, which is another um, uh, threatened species. Um, and you can see sort of characteristic markings of um, crayfish in the stream. These are literal notches taken out of their tail by crayfish um, claws. Um, and then um, on the left, I'm not gonna go super into these, but it was a, a really interesting study um, out of Pepperdine by Courtney Davis. And she was looking at sort of 
extinction likelihood in, um, in these new populations in the same exact stream um, based on how, um, so this is um, 5,000 removed over a year, 5,000 crayfish in a trapping year, and these are strategies. So trapping three months out of the year and trapping six months out of the year. And just basically the takeaway from this is that the more you trap and the more frequently you trap, the more blue bars that you show, more likelihood of newts um, surviving after um, a generation. And then this sort of red trailing dooming bars um, extinction of the species in those creeks. Um, so I talked a little bit about what crayfish are, what invasive species are, and um, how they impact our streams. And now I want to talk a little bit about what the Mountains Restoration Trust is doing to combat that. Um, so um, since um, 2010, really, we've been doing this removal effort, but um, at these sites more extensively, we've been working since 2014. Um, and um, we're working out of Malibu Creek um, or Las Virginis Creek, and then also in um, Medea Creek, which is on the left. And in both of these creeks, we re removed um, over 200,000 um, crayfish, um, and then um, nearly 70,000 crayfish in, um, in Medea Creek, which is um, a lot of crayfish. <laughs> uh, that's the next slide. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like just sort of a day in the life of a crayfish trapper. Um, these, this is my um, team of biotechnicians that works for me. Um, and um, this is um, sort of the inside of one of the traps that we use. So we use um, minnow traps in our two study sites. We're out there seven days a week trapping these crayfish and we have nearly a thousand traps in the water at this point. Um, and we do that every single day. We're removing them um, from the creeks. And um, we do a lot of work also with our seasonal biosurveys. Um, so the data that I was showing you with the crayfish, or with the, the tadpoles, um, those come from our biosurveys, which we do to assess how our work is impacting the positive species in our creek, the natives. Um, and then also I just wanted to touch a little bit on the sort of dynamic mountain streams that we have. So we live in the Malibu, or we work in the Malibu Creek watershed, which has a lot of ephemeral water bodies. So these creeks are drying on a regular basis. Um, almost every summer they're drying. And that does a really fantastic job, maybe even better than the trapping that we're doing, at getting rid of these crayfish. And then also, especially with this um, super wet winter that we've had, um, we've seen a lot of flushing of the crayfish out to the lagoon and out to the sea, which has been phenomenal for sort of getting rid of these populations. Where we used to be trapping, say, um, 9,000 crayfish a month, we're getting, you know, 200. So it's an it's a order of magnitude just because of rain. So it's pretty phenomenal. And then I just wanted to give you some sort of visual representation over the lifetime of our, pro of our projects, how, um, how many crayfish we've been removing. So like on a monthly basis, sometimes it can be up to 9,000. And you see this dynamic in, in our effort where um, immediately when you move into an area, when you put a lot of effort into it, you're getting a lot of crayfish. And then gradually over time, um, we're showing that like our project can you know, completely remove them from the stream. You see sort of a negative um, downward slope. You can go to the next one. This one's a little um, harder to interpret. It's, um, you can see that there's sort of like three epics in this, and those um, correspond to when we increase our efforts. So these sort of, since the beginning of the project in 2015, we've been incrementally moving more and more downstream, and each time you see another peak, it's as we move into more territory, so more crayfish and more um, areas of stream covered. But you can always notice the sort of downward slope at the end as we sort of overexploit the resource. And then this is sort of our um, proud accomplishment. Um, we've cleared um, completely, we've removed cr uh, crayfish completely from this two mile stretch of creek that we've been working in since 2014. And this is sort of a, a huge challenge for us actually is this section where we've like exploited basically everything that's in the creek um, except for a few sort of cryptic or less active or smaller crayfish that are very, very hard and it takes a lot of intensive effort for us to um, catch these few remaining ones. But we're actually, we're, we've been cleared in these sites for a long time now, so it's been awesome. And then I wanted to talk really briefly one more sort of trapping success that we've had, like a big success story. Um, these, again, we're gonna go back to the California newts and this is, um, all this data is presented, or it was um, from um, Lee Katz and Pepperdine University. Um, and so um, he, these um, graphs I'm showing you here are two um, survey periods of the California newts. Um, one in 2003, 
during the beginning of an intensive crayfish removal project, and then again in 2005 after they had cleared the streams of crayfish. And um, we can just scroll through these, but um, it's, it's largely, he's looking at um, adults. These are egg masses um, and um, larvae of the newts. And you're seeing um, in the adults and the egg masses, you're seeing a, a ton more, right? So there's more adults alive. Um, there's more egg masses, so they're, they're breeding more. And then, especially in the larvae, it's um, really important that you see not only breeding, but also survival of the young. And you're seeing that only after a two-year removal of crayfish. So they can be really impactful in the stream. Um, and so just a couple more uh, things that MRT is doing. Um, we recently, um, through a generous donation by the um, Las Virginias Municipal Water District, um, were able to start um, doing some water quality testing. Um, they donated a, a really nice probe to us. Um, so we're going to be doing some um, water quality um, testing to sort of identify how our removal, how our crayfish removal in these streams, how it's in, impacting the water, right? So. In the literature, it, it, it highlights these, these parameters, pH, dissolved oxygen, all these things that the crayfish can negatively impact. And we wanna see before our removal, during our removal, and after our removal, how these are changing and how we're improving the habitat. And then sort of our second question is, um, are we able to bring the habitat back to a level that's acceptable for steelhead trout? So when they do, or if they ever do have access to their historic ranges, will it be good for them? Um, and then we're also analyzing right now, so these are some of the traps in the water. Um, right now we're analyzing, because um, no one really has done a lot of work with what works to get rid of crayfish. Everyone sort of has their approach to it, but there isn't a real definite way to know um, what is really effective. So right now we're um, in the beginning phase of a pilot um, project of looking at different trap design um, and seeing how it relates to um, the amount of crayfish removed also, but also we're using um, this little um, charismatic guy, the um, Arroyo Chub, as sort of a stand-in for um, uh, a salmonid, so um, like a steelhead, basically. We're looking at how these interact with different trap types, so if we do end up expanding into places that do have steelhead, or if steelhead are in creeks where we are trapping, we're making sure that we're not harming them, we're making sure that we're not trapping them, et cetera. All right, so Candace did a good job of introducing our lab. Um, we focus on invasive species ecology and management. We also focus on plant insect interactions and ecological restoration. Um, like Candace said, our lead researchers are um, Tom Dudley and Adam Lambert in the left picture there. And our lab also consists of staff like Jared and me, um, grad students like Shelley, and also undergrads. And these are some pictures of the fun stuff we do in the field sometimes. Um, so the Santa Clara River is really cool and it's very important, um, but unfortunately it faces some challenges, including urban development, agriculture, and dams and levees. Um, Joe talked about what invasive species are, but just to reiterate, um, they are species that are not native to a certain region and can cause ecological or economic harm. They are also um, a major cause of extinctions. Some people say that they are the second um, most pressing cause of extinctions after urban development. Next, please. Um, all right, so the Santa Clara River has over 45 species of invasive plants and over 35 species of invasive animals. And today, I'm gonna to be talking about um, three aquatic invasive animals, the African clawed frog, the New Zealand mud snail, and the quagga mussel. Um, Shelley is going to be talking about a new invasive beetle, the polyphagous shot hole borer, and Jared is going to be talking about a huge invasive plant, Arundo donex, also known as giant reed. Okay, so the African clawed frog is native to sub-Saharan Africa, and it was brought to the U.S. in the 1940s to be used in biological research. Um, it was also used as a pregnancy test, so people who thought they might be pregnant would inject their urine into the frog, and if the frog laid eggs, that means the person was pregnant. Um, uh, the frog is also very uh, popular as a pet, and so once a better pregnancy test was developed and people get tired of um, their pet frogs, these frogs get released into the wild, where they have become invasive in many places, including the Santa Clara River. Um, 
So these are very successful invaders because they're very hardy. Um, they can live in disturbed areas and they also have very good defense mechanisms. You can see in this photo that they have really big muscular back legs allowing them to quickly pull away from predators. Um, they also secrete toxins from their skin that deter predators. Um, they also have a bunch of babies and they can live for a long time, like up to 15 years. Next, please. Um, so African clawed frogs, similar to the crayfish, I guess, they eat everything, including inverts like other frogs and fish. And so this is, Im this is important um, because sometimes they will eat endangered species like red-legged frogs or tidewater gobies. Um, these frogs can also spread deadly fungal diseases to native amphibians, um, and they also alter behavior of native amphibians. For example, um, some frogs will not breed in the presence of African clawed frogs, and tadpoles also do not forage in the presence of predators, and so this um, essentially limits the suitable habitat for these native amphibians. So like a lot of invasive species, um, these clawed frogs are very difficult to eradicate once they've arrived to an area. Um, but some methods of control that people have had some success with include trapping, draining ponds, using chemicals like chlorine, which the frogs are um, sensitive to, and also using legislation to ban them in the pet trade. Okay, so our second invasive species of the night are New Zealand, New Zealand mud snails. And as their name suggests, they are native to New Zealand. Um, they were found in Idaho in 1987, likely brought to the United States through ships or importing live fish. Um, and they were found in Pirate Creek around 2004. And once they got to the United States, they were likely um, spread around to different bodies of water through recreational activities like boating. Um, so these snails are super tiny. They're four to six millimeters. As you can see in that photo, um, there's a bunch of snails with a dime for scale. Um, they can tolerate high temperatures and sal salinity. Um, and they can survive for long periods out of water. So these mud snails can occur at extremely high densities. As you can see in this photo, all these little black dots are snails. Um, so they can use up a lot of the food resources that then are no longer available to native invertebrates. Native invertebrates are a really important food source for fish like trout. Um, so not only do the mud snails outcompete and displace native invertebrates, they themselves are not a very nutritious food source for fish. Um, and they have been shown to pass through the guts of fish un undigested and even alive sometimes. Um, so some methods of control for the mud snail um, include chemical controls like using chlorine again. Uh, physical controls like heat or filtration, biological controls like releasing a trematode parasite that kills the snail. But once they get into an area, it's very difficult to eradicate them. And so what's really important is containing them where they occur and preventing them from entering new bodies of water. And to do that, um, we can clean, disinfect, and dry our gear, and also never move plants and animals from one body of water to another. All right, so our third species, um, the quagga mussel. This is native to Ukraine. Um, it was found in the Great Lakes in 1989, probably also from um, ballast water from ships. Um, and it was found very recently in Lake Piru in 2013. So the larvae are free swimming and very tiny, um, which is how they get transported unintentionally because you can't see them. Um, and also, this is how they get dispersed downstream. Um, and then the muscle adults can attach to hard or soft surfaces. Um, so similar to the mud snails, quagga mussels can alter water quality and food webs. They're very efficient um, filter feeders. And so again, they take a lot of the food resources out of the water that the native inverts can't use. And then that leaves, again, less food for fish like trout. Um, because they can d so densely attach to surfaces, they also can clog pipes and boats which is very costly to manage. So like I said earlier, um, they were found in Lake Piru in 2013, but the United Water Conservation District, um, who manages water in the Santa Clara River, recently found two more occurrences of quagga mussels just a few months ago in 2016. So the first new one was in Angeles Tunnel, um, which uh, transports water from Northern California to LA. And the second occurrence was at the Castaic power plant, which is at the edge of Lake Castaic, or Castaic Lake, excuse me. 
Um, so again, they're really hard to eradicate once they get to a place. Um, there are chemical, physical, and biological controls, but again, it's really important to prevent them from moving from one body of water to another. So remember to clean, dry, clean, drain, and dry your gear so that you don't move a muscle. <laughs> I, thank you, that's my portion. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm Shelly, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Polyphagus shot hole borer, which is a new invasive ambrosia beetle here in Southern California. And ambrosia beetles are related to bark beetles. They live inside of trees, and the word ambrosia means food of the gods. It refers to a symbiotic relationship that the beetles have with fungus. So the beetles carry this fungus with them in their mouth parts, and when they bore into a tree, they inoculate the fungus into the gallery that they make below the bark, and that's what the beetles feed on. So they really rely on that fungus to live. Um, like I said, they're newly invasive in California. They were first found in LA County in 2003 and here in Ventura County in 2015. And they are native to Vietnam. It's thought that they were probably brought here on some contaminated wood or shipping containers or things like that. Um, so they do vector the fungal species that they live with called Fusarium. And um, this can cause a disease in the tree, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So they do cause Fusarium dieback. The way this works is, like I said, the beetle bores into the tree. It will inoculate the fungus into the gallery, and that's what the beetles will feed on. However, the fungus can grow from outside of the gallery into the tree's xylem. And that's the tube that transports water from the roots up to the branches of the tree. And the fungus can basically clog up this transport system, blocking water transport, causing branch dieback, and sometimes complete mortality of the host tree. As you can see here, this tree has experienced extensive branch mortality and will likely die pretty soon. So uh, shot hole borer is spreading very rapidly throughout California. There's actually two forms that we have here in Southern California. We have the Plifka shot hole borer, which you can see in the red dots, and that's where they've been located. And there's also the Kurosho shot hole borer, which is morphologically identical but genetically distinct. And that one is found, or it's shown in the blue dots, and that one's found uh, in San Diego County and most recently found in Santa Barbara County. And the Plificate shot hole borer, you can press the button, was first found, like I said, in 2003 in LA County, right there at Whittier Heights. And since then, it has had a quite fast expanding range. It's thought that it's mostly human facilitated because the beetles are only thought to um, disperse about eight miles a year on, the, on their own. And clearly, they've gotten a lot farther than that. Um, so most likely, that's from humans um, transporting contaminated firewood or things like that. So not only are they spreading quickly, they also have an extremely wide host range. They've been detected in 342 different plants, including important agricultural plants like avocado, um, important riparian plants like willows, and important uh, urban or landscape trees like sycamore. Um, but not all of these uh, plants can support the um, reproduction of the beetle. There are about 49 reproductive hosts that the beetle can complete its life cycle. And these are really important to focus on because this is where the beetles will be able to um, facilitate outwards from and uh, make new colonies. So here's a list of all the reproductive hosts. Um, you can see it's a lot of our important riparian trees like cottonwoods, willows, sycamores, um, maples, oak trees, maybe something that you have in your yard and something that you care about, and also avocados, which I know is very important um, for everyone. <laughs> so because of their um, wide range or fast uh, spreading range, as well as their wide host range, they um, have a bunch of potential impacts, including economic losses to the avocado industry, which was valued at over 300,000 or 300 million in 2015. Um, and we've seen a lot of dieback on those trees, which could reduce the yield as well as the quality of the yield produced by the avocado trees. And I think what a lot of us care about here is the loss of riparian habitat and those ecosystem services provided by riparian trees, including um, temperature control, which is important for in-stream organisms like trout, um, providing large woody debris for fish or other animals to make their homes in within streams. They also provide erosion control and filter, buffer, filter and buffer nutrients from agricultural runoff. So even though this beetle is tiny, it's about two millimeters in length, um, it can pose some pretty huge impacts to us. Um, this is an example of the Tijuana River Valley in San Diego. This was actually the Crochio shot hole borer, but they're functionally the same. So um, anyways, uh, this picture up here is from May 2015. Um, that's a stand of willow trees. 
And uh, just a few months later in February 2016, that whole area was decimated. Um, within the Tijuana River Valley, about 140,000 willow trees were damaged or died. And that was all attributed to the Kurosio shot hole bore. And um, with the loss of these riparian trees, these uh, landscapes are left vulnerable to invasion by non-tree, non, or non-native and non-tree species, such as arundo or castor bean. And already they've seen a huge increase in these invasive species in the Tijuana River Valley. And these are two um, pretty bad invasive species that we have here in the Santa Clara River. And if we see impacts like this at the Santa Clara River, it's likely that we'll see more invasion by these invasive plants. So the way we've been tracking the shot hole bores is by using these two liter bottle traps. It's basically an inverted two liter bottle with a window cut out. Um, and we use a quisiverol lure. This is a chemical attractant that is specific to the shot hole bores. The beetles, if they're present, they will be attracted to the lure, they'll fly into the trap, and then fall down into the preservative. And so we've been using this to not only track their presence, but also try and track their dispersal to see where their range is dispersing to. Um, like I said, the shot hole bore was detected in Ventura County in 2015. In this map, you can see the blue dots show where we have not detected them, but we do have a trap there. And the red is where we have detected them. So we do have a pretty extensive infestation in Santa Paula and the surrounding areas. And already we have seen um, some dieback of willow trees. And we think that this is attributed to a combination of the drought, which weakened the plants, and then the, this new invasive beetle. So what are we going to do about this invasive pest? Um, people have been working on developing control methods. The first thing you can do is if you have a, an infested plant is to remove the infested bark or the whole entire tree. But that can be very costly and time consuming because you would have to chip the wood into pieces smaller than one inch to completely eradicate the beetle and the fungus from the wood. Or you can solarize the wood on site with um, a plastic tarp. Um, but that can take a couple months to, to do. Next slide. Um, people at UC Riverside are also studying um, chemical control using insecticides and fungicides. They looked at both topical applications as well as systemic applications of pesticides using a whole array of pesticides. But unfortunately, none of these have been shown to be 100% effective at eradicating the beetle or the fungus. Um, but people are still working on that, so there's still hope there. But we think our next best bet is using biological control. And this is basically going to the species home range, in this case Vietnam, and um, looking for what are its predators in the home range and uh, taking back those predators, going through extensive testing to see if they're going to affect any non-target host species here. And if they are shown to be very specialized to the species you want to control, then um, they can be released. So a parasitoid wasp was found in Asia that uh, researchers at UC Riverside have brought here and are now working on that process, but it'll take up to two years to get USDA approval for that. And they're also working on uh, endophytic bacteria and fungi. These are basically species of bacteria or fungi that are already present within the tree and do not cause harm to the tree that might be able to control or inhibit the growth of the fusarium. You can see there that fusarium is plated out and there's a couple different fungal species around it and all of them but one are actually inhibiting its growth. Um, but this has not been actually done on a wide scale so we're not really ready to introduce this into natural settings. But more work is on the way. So what's next for our lab? We're gonna continue monitoring and surveying infestations in Ventura and beyond. I'm doing a lot of work also in Santa Barbara County, um, serving for the Crochet Shot Hole Board there. We're gonna implement um, the appropriate control measures in the Santa Clara River. Not sure what those are yet. Um, and then we're gonna continue education and outreach. And I wanted to remind you that this beetle is transported primarily by the movement of firewood, so please um, burn it where you buy it and be careful not to move firewood around. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared. I'm not going to stand too close to the microphone, so can everybody hear me at least a little bit? Yes. Sweet. Um, I'm a restoration technician with the River Lab, so I'm implementing a lot of the restoration at our restoration site, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, when talking about invasive species along the river, it'd be kind of hard to leave out Arundo. Um, it's a huge problem. If you live in Southern California, which most of you probably do, I bet you've seen it around. Um, and it's considered one of the five worst weeds uh, by California Invasive Plant Council. 
So it's a perennial grass, just a little bit of background for you guys. Perennial grass, perennial just means that it's not annual, its life cycle goes on multiple years. So it grows to be three to 10 meters tall. It can grow five to seven centimeters within a day. Uh, it's native in the area that's highlighted right there from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia. And it's become over time established on every continent other than Antarctica. Um, it was introduced to California in the first place in the 1800s by Western settlers. Uh, most likely for its beneficial uses. Um, like many plants, people think it's a good idea to bring over in the first place before they realize the um, consequences of their actions. So it was used in historically and actually still currently commercially for musical instruments. Um, it was a very good construction material to build houses and other things of the sort. And it was used for erosion control too, but I'll get into why that's not a good idea. And horticultural, some people like it in their yards, helps them block their view of the neighbor, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, it could also even be used for bioenergy because it's so quickly growing. So as I was saying, things after its introduction got a little bit out of control. You can see this entire field completely taken over by a monoculture of Arenda. And here in the Santa Clara, it's also, this is a picture of the Santa Clara River, a segment of it where we do most of our work. Uh, you can see Santa Paula covered up there a little bit in Fillmore. Um, the red dots are um, where there's up to 100% infestation of Arenda. That would be where there's no other species growing in a given area other than Arenda. And it goes all the way down to 1%. But you can see pretty much everywhere along this area has a dot, meaning that there is at least some percentage of Arenda cover, which is pretty significant, as I was saying, 4,000 to 5,000 acres of Arenda just in this very small area. So um, why is Arenda so successful? Uh, if you look up at the picture in the top left, you can see big flower heads at the top of the plant, uh, which is kind of misleading because most of the time when you see flowers, you think reproduction, but um, their flowers are actually, the seeds within them are sterile. So they do all this shredding through rhizomes, which are underground stems. You've got pictures of them here. Actually looks a little bit blurry right now, but they kind of look like huge chunks of ginger, would be my way of describing it. And they have a large amount of carbon storage, um, so they could be disrooted or dislodged from the tree, or the plant, sorry, and uh, brought downstream. They can remain dormant for months, and then when they find suitable conditions, they will sprout right up and start spreading. Um, they can also grow really well under stressful conditions. I can tell you that because at our restoration site, when other things were struggling because of the drought, Arundo was just as happy as ever. <laughs> you could maybe see it a little bit of discoloration, but it was still there. Um, it has really broad environmental tolerances. It can be found anywhere from brackish water to fresh water, and as far as soil goes, it does really well on clay soil or all the way to very loose sandy soil. Um, so impacts of a rondo invasion, you saw how prevalent it is, but why do we really care how much of it there is? I'm gonna get into that. Um, first thing we we'll talk about hydrology. Um, as I mentioned before, people originally introduced it uh, for stabilization of banks and whatnot, um, which works for a limited amount of time, but eventually you'll see um, It'll collect sediment on top of it, and eventually the stream will start to undercut below the roots, and they'll become dislodged. And then at that point, they cause um, sedimentation, uh, they block the waterways, slow water flow, and make the waterways overall much less navigable. And they are also huge water users. Um, compared to riparian species you might find in the same area, uh, it's estimated they use up to three times more water. And to give you an idea of what that means, uh, one square meter of a rundo can use up to 2,000 liters of water in its lifetime. Um, another major problem is it disturbs a fire regime. Um, waterways might be thought of as a natural fire break, but a rundo grows so densely and can hang over waterways, and it burns very intensely and brightly, even when it's completely healthy and green. So it is actually causing more likely there to be fires in areas. And if you can see, the picture down above is immediately after a fire. Down below is one month after the fire. And you can already see all of this is a rundo growing back. So it's what you'd call a fire follower. Um, it's very quick to establish itself after a disturbance, which is a problem because all the other species take longer to recover. And they're completely excluded once there's such a dense covering of a rundo where they can't get in any light or nutrients. Um, more importantly to some people, maybe, would be its impact on wildlife. Um, starting on a smaller level, uh, it has a major impact on insects. Its leaves are mostly unpalatable and contain chemicals that are actually toxic to some species. So 
Um, it's been shown that as a rundo density increases, uh, insect abundance steadily decreases, which causes a problem for higher trophic levels like birds who need insects uh, as a food source. It also is uninhabitable for birds because it grows so densely. I mean, kind of imagine a bird trying to fly through that, it's not very likely. And on top of that, it doesn't have the diverse canopy structure that you'd find in other riparian species, such as willows or sycamores, so, or in any kind of understory necessarily. So it doesn't provide the nesting grounds or um, pr uh, protection from predation. And this is uh, just a graph from one of our collaborators who does uh, bird transects for us. And it just shows how as percent cover rundo increases, the species richness of birds, which is the number of species that you'd be able to find in a given area, steadily decreases. So we are at the Caltrout talk, so I gotta, I gotta talk about steelhead. They are a major impact on steelhead overall too, because you can see here, uh, just kind of giving you an idea um, of how they grow into waterways and cause disturbance. I mentioned they make them less navigable, but they also, through sedimentation, can slow water flow um, to an extreme amount to the point where water will actually um, evaporate more. So that causes lower water levels, warmer water, and also lower oxygen within the water, all of which are bad for aquatic insects, like this caddis fly you see over here, which are a food source for trout. Um, so I'm going to get into how to kill a runda, which is actually one of the major parts of my job. <laughs> um, you can see here, uh, as the picture before, you saw just a complete stand, and I've shown you plenty of other pictures of it. It's nothing but a runda. So what we do in an area like this where there's no sensitive species and there's no other native plants growing within it is we'd go through with a large industrial mower and masticate the area, um, which works for a limited amount of time. Uh, there will be re-sprouts, so future application of herbicide and whatnot will be necessary. Um, so following mowing, we might go by with a backpack sprayer. Um, I know all too well. Um, and that requires multiple applications, but it can be effective. I'd say the most effective way to control is what we call the cut and daub method, which is where we go through with either a weed whacker or hand loppers and we cut the uh, plant as close to the base as possible, and somebody follows behind and daubs it with herbicide, which is great because it's a direct application. Um, it's very effective, but it's also very timely and money intensive. So it has its drawbacks, but it is definitely the most effective. So as I mentioned, the other methods of a rental control can be quite costly and um, t take a lot of time. So. As um, Mickey and Shelley have both mentioned, this is where we might turn to biocontrol. Um, so looking back at its native range, anywhere from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia, we would look at things that predate it there and think about the possibility of their introduction. We already have in the Santa Clara River area the Arunda wasp. As you can see there, it bores into the stems of Arunda. Um, unfortunately though, it doesn't cause complete dieback and it doesn't seem to be a completely effective measure for Arundo control. So right now the USDA is testing um, for release the scale, a type of scale insect that actually feeds on the rhizomes, which are the underground stems I was mentioning before. Um, it hasn't been cleared for release yet, but we're hoping that it's more promising than the Arundo wasp. It'd be nice to not have to walk around with a backpack of herbicide on my back every day. Um, so what do we do once we remove the arundo? Um, we obviously don't want nothing there. We want to replace it with native vegetation. So we have a few different methods. As you can see, spreading seed, um, planting things from container from our native nursery where we propagate the plants, and maybe not common to everybody would be pole cuttings. Um, a lot of species you could take um, an entire branch from. So we'll go and find a healthy willow tree that has a few branches to spare, more like maybe one or two. We're not going to go for three. but. Um, as a branch to spare, maybe take a five or six foot cutting of it, um, plant into the ground about four feet deep, leaving some exposed, and it'll actually re-sprout from the top of it, which is nice because you get to skip the, seed, uh, uh, st uh, skip the stage of being a seedling, which is when plants tend to have the most mortality. So once again, keep in mind our goal is to go from this to this. First off, um, getting rid of all the arundo, and you can see it's very clear and not much else. And then two years later, um, due to active restoration, we've started to revegetate the area. And from this point on, the goal would be to have passive restoration take place. That's when 
um, the species that are already there disperse their seeds and you don't have to actively take part in the restoration. It's a uh, very good measure of success when it comes to restoration if your site is sustainable and can contain itself in the long term. So now getting into where we are doing this, um, many of you may be um, familiar with Santa Paula and Fillmore area. Um, that's the distribution of where we have uh, restoration sites. But I'm going to talk mostly about uh, Hedrick Ranch Nature Area, uh, also known as HRNA. That's the star right there on the map. Uh, the property has been in the Hedrick Ranch Family Trust since 1940, and to give you an idea of how degraded it was at the time, I don't, it's a good property for them to get us, but it had um, cattle ranching and also citrus orchards on it and other agricultural practice, practices, so it's been a long time coming to get the restoration to take place. Um, it was one of the first pr uh, properties purchased as part of the Santa Clara River Parkway, and with the help of the Nature Conservancy, it was given to Friends of the Santa Clara River. Um, and they began restoration on it in 2004 on around 40 acres and UCSB following up around 10 years later continued with their restoration and expanded onto neighboring properties. So here is a picture of our native plant nursery. You can see the picture when we first started up in 2004. Um, you can see the arenda in the background. Um, we've come a little bit further. Uh, we actually even have it nicer now but I didn't have a current picture when I was throwing together the slideshow. But as you can see, this is where we uh, propagate all of our native plants and we have a lot of help from volunteers here coming out and helping us transplant and actually plant the stuff into nature too as well. And so to evaluate the success of our restoration efforts, we have different types of monitoring that we do to follow up on ourselves. Um, first of which would be bird monitoring. Um, uh, we also do vegetation transects to give us an idea of how vegetation changes over time. Uh, Phenology monitoring. Phenology is the seasonology of trees, you could say. So it kind of gives us an idea of how flowering times and fruiting times and when they're producing or losing leaves is changing based on the years or different environmental conditions such as drought stress. Uh, we also do insect monitoring. As I've mentioned, it's an important uh, food source for higher trophic levels. So it's good to understand what there is out there for things to eat. And that's a picture of me doing groundwater, groundwater monitoring. We have wells that we monitor um, bi-weekly every other week um, at our sites. So as I mentioned, we have plenty of volunteers, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, I'll let you read over the list because it's extensive and we're much appreciative. Um, activities we involve them in is plant installation, transplanting, weed control, and we got to have a little bit of fun with that too. So we take them on nature walks, a little educational. Um, and just in this last year alone, we put 438 native plants in the ground, or I should say you volunteers put 438 native plants in the ground. Uh, in the future, uh, we're going to have more volunteer opportunities and we'll have our information at the end of this slideshow. If you want to reach out to us, we would love your help. Uh, so future plans, uh, there's been talk about connectivity within uh, the Santa Clara River and the watershed as a whole. Um, we're always looking to collaborate with other entities and overall our goal would be to eradicate Arundo and other invasive species and replace them with native vegetation that is productive and healthy and supports flora and fauna. So thank you for your time. Um, as I mentioned, this is, I'm Jared, Mickey and Shelley both presented. We're all a part of River Lab, uh, which stands for Riparian Invasion Research Lab. And we have plenty of partners, all of which we're very grateful for.